Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that your word never changes. And Father, it is just as powerful today as the day in which it was written and the days in which you spoke into the lives of your servants over the centuries. Father, as we get into your word this morning, as we dig deep into those things of you, we pray that we will have nuggets that we can take away to help us in what's going on in and around us. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I've rather sort of ironically titled this one, Lessons in the Life of Moses 3, Get the Extinguisher. Um, just to remind you a little bit about Moses, that of course Moses was in the land of Egypt, uh, the little duck map here, if you remember we've seen this one before, okay, the children of Israel were in this area of what's called Lower Egypt, or the, the ends of the, I the Nile in Goshen down here, and as you remember they built these cities and bits and pieces. And Exodus chapter 2 covers the sort of the first 40 years of Moses' life in 25 verses, that's pretty good going. And as you will know that Moses did something that maybe wasn't as quite as wise as he should have done and that he was basically chased out of Egypt which is what we find at the end of chapter 2. But for a moment if you'd just like to turn with me to the book of Acts because one of the great things about it is the Bible, that the Bible comments upon itself. So if you turn with me to Acts chapter 7 for a minute, um, I just want to have a look at a couple of verses there, because Acts chapter 7 gives us quite a little summary. And in Acts chapter 7, and if we read in verse 22, we find the following, right at the end of his training... It says, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deed. So as Paul was writing here about, about Moses, following his training, he reached this particular point. And we reckon that probably that was about 28 years of training. Because he would have moved on from being with his mother somewhere around the age of 12, 13, um, the age at which people, young men or boys, became men at that time. And therefore, he would have had about 28, 27 years of training. And in verse 23, it says in Acts chapter 7, it says, Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. As we saw last time, God stirred his heart. And then we keep reading through and it says, And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. Sometimes we know a calling of God on our lives. And sometimes we have to be very careful we do not run ahead of what God has for us. Running ahead can be as bad as not moving at all. And that's why, in James, he reminds us, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives abundantly. We need to know God's abundant wisdom. We have to know God's abundant wisdom as to, for example, when we go shopping. I don't suggest you go to Asda this morning. But that's a serious. How do we as Christians, how are we going to survive going on? When all around us, they are turning around Ocado's, not taking any more bookings. Soon Tesco's, I think. Tesco's, I think, you're, it's a fortnight for a booking slot, for a delivery. You know, when do we go and get that food? I'm not, you know, we will need God's wisdom. That we can get what we need when we need it. And you see, it, Moses ran ahead of God, and it didn't quite go too well. And in verse 25, it said, He supposed his brethren would have understood, and they didn't. In verse 26, And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and tried to reconcile them. Men, men, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbour wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? The answer was actually God. But it wasn't quite God's time for him to be in that place. Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian? And at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller of in land of Midian, and he had two sons. And in verse 30 it says the following, And when forty years had passed, 
an angel of the Lord appeared to him. And that's where we're going to pick it up this morning. So let's turn back to Exodus chapter 3. Let's read the whole chapter and let's see what's happened. You see, what we've got is we've got that Moses was probably based up here, Goshan, Ramesses, these sort of areas here. And he had run out into the desert, into this area here, into the Sinai Peninsula down here. And this is where we find Moses and it picks up. One of the things that people struggle with the Bible, and that is the Bible is not exactly linear. You know, it doesn't run, you know, the end of one chapter doesn't necessarily give you the beginning of the next. You know, there are gaps. And when we come to look at the plagues, at some point, I hope, you know, I hope we'll be able to keep going and get to the plagues. When we get to the plagues, I will, we will look at them and you will see it's not day one, day two, day three, day four. Because the word of God doesn't, it's not linear like that. There are gaps. And the important thing is that when there are gaps, that doesn't mean to say God's not working. You know, this morning, if you say, well, God's called me to this ministry and that ministry see, appears to have closed... That doesn't mean to say God hasn't got something to do with you. It might mean that actually God has got something to do with you. And it's a lot about you and not about him. He needs to get him into you and get maybe you out of you. You know, sometimes we struggle with that. We want to be doing. I'm somebody who wants to be doing. But I've discovered recently that sometimes not doing something is quite profitable. Just going for a walk, there was nobody, I went for a walk yesterday morning, I had two four-legged things with me, and I went for a long walk yesterday morning, and can I tell you, uh, there was a real sense of God as I was walking. And I felt God speak to me, and he said one or two things, and he shared one or two things. There was nobody around, there was just the birds, the trees, and sometimes we need to get away just to be able to do things. And I wonder, see the interesting thing about everything that's going on at the moment is that I think God is also using this to sort out the church. And that is important that we, as Dion has prayed, that we are sensitive to what God wants us to do. Is there a neighbour who you have never ever spoken to who actually this is your opportunity to speak to them? Is this your opportunity to serve them? You know, we live in a very insular society. But now is the time when we're going to have to muck in together. And as Christians, we're also going to have to be those who serve and we learn to serve the community. But let's have a look at Exodus chapter 3. And it says the following, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock into the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire and in the midst of the bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush did not burn. So the Lord saw that he turned aside and looked and God called to him in the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not draw near this place, tuck your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, and he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, surely I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Pesuzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold the cry that the children of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Now come now, therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you, that I have brought you, brought the people of Egypt, you shall serve on this mountain. And then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I have come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? 
And God said to Moses, I am who I am, he said. And thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Moreover, God said to Moses, you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord your God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob appeared to me saying, surely I have visited you and seen what is done with you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, to a land flowing with milk and honey. Then will they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt, and you will say to him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now, please, let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I'm sure the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt, and with all my wonders will do in its midst. After that he will let you go. And I will give you this people for favour in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be, and it shall be when you go, you shall not go empty-handed, but every woman shall ask of her neighbour, namely her who dwells near the house, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, and you shall plunder the Egyptians. We praise God for his word. Amazing when you pick in this. There is so much in this particular passage. But let's have a look this morning, and let's start to sort of uh, pick into it as we go. So let's start with verse 1. And as we look in verse 1, it says, And Moses was tending the flocks of his father. Sometimes we just have to get on with the day job. Do not decry where God has put you. I had to learn that years and years and years ago. I thought God wanted me to go, you know, I was going to do a bit of time in school and then I was going off to do ministry. No, God has kept me there and kept me there and kept me there. And one of the things I've done every Easter is I've gone before the Lord and I've said, Lord, do you still want me in school the next academic year? And he said, yes. And that has gone on for quite a few years. But you see, if God is calling us, there is often a time of preparation to go on, but there is nothing wrong with the day job. God needs people in his kingdom who can actually go out and earn money for the kingdom and bring it into the kingdom. That's important. But you see, there is preparation to be done. And often the preparation happens here, and it says, and Jethro, his father, it was tending the flocks of Jethro, his father, the priest of Midian. He wasn't any old priest, he was the top man, top honcho in the tribe of, Mi of the Midianites. Because his name means that. And he led the flock to the back of the desert. Nothing is ever put in the Bible for chance. Sometimes the back of beyond is where God wants us to be. Far and far and far away from where we want to be, but it's where God wants us to be. The back of the desert. And actually, that is the place sometimes where God can really speak to us. When we're at that lowest point, and it says he came to Horeb, to the mountain of God. Now here we go, it's a little map. So we'd come all the way from up here, all the way down here, right the way down to the Mount of Horeb in Sinai, called the Mountain of God. Away from everybody else. And so there we find, as we get there, Horeb in the middle of Sinai. This is the place where later on they were going to receive the Ten Commandments. It was the place in Exodus 17 where the water was going to come from the rock that was split. It's also the place, and we might want to look in, just let's look for a minute, in 1 Kings chapter 19. One Kings 19, verses 8 and 9. I trust we won't be needing this sort of supernatural food. So it said, he arose and he ate and he drank and he went in the strength that that, of that food for 40 days and 40 nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And he went into a cave and spent a night there, 
and in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah goes through, you know, and he justifies why it is that he's run away from where God actually needed him to be. But importantly, in verse, that he'd responded to the voice of the Lord. So you see, we find Elijah was there. And then we move on to verse 2. And when we look at verse 2, we said the following, and it says, And the angel of the Lord, not an angel, it says the angel of the Lord. Jesus appeared to Moses in a pre-incarnate form. Wherever you see in the Bible, the angel of the Lord, that is referring to Jesus. Jesus appeared to him. And the, the one immediately says to us, well, when did we last meet with Jesus? Now, do we have our regular times when we meet with Jesus? Have we ever met with Jesus? Do we know Jesus as our Saviour and our Lord? Because if we don't, we can't be those in Psalm 91 who dwell under the shadow of the Most High. Because that's where we need to be as Christians. That's where we need to be, trusting in God 100%, living under the shadow of the Most High. And it says, The angel of the Lord appeared in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. You see, the question was, had he seen fire in bushes before? Chances are pretty good, yes. He'd been living out in the desert. There would have been storms, there would have been fires in the bushes out there. But you see, he looked, as it says, he looked, and behold, the bush was not consumed. God wanted to get his attention. And you see, one of the things about this is that I think God's got all of our attention by what's going on. I don't know a single Christian who isn't digging back into God's Word. And I know, I know some of the people I work with who I would describe as don't regularly read God's Word, but there's something, I was talking to somebody on Thursday, and they were saying, oh, I started to look in the Bible to see what it says about what's going on. Praise the Lord. But you see, God wanted to get his attention. And in verse 3 it says, And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. God got him through his inquisitiveness and caused him to draw close. God wants us to draw close to him. You see, an ordinary burning bush would have had no interest to Moses, but this one, God got his attention through. And you see, in verse as we move on, and as we move on to uh, verse 4, it says the following. It says, should say verse 4, yes, there we go. And in verse 4 it says, So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, when God had got his attention, he then spoke to him. And he said, he didn't say, Oi, you shepherd, did he? He didn't say that. He didn't say, oi, come over here, you with the sheep. He called him by name. And he called him twice, didn't he? He said, Moses, Moses. God knows our name. God can get our attention. And you see, the interesting thing is, he knew God's voice. That 40 years in the wilderness had not been wasted because he'd had 40 years to get to this very very important day this was the day he was going to move out into the things that God had been preparing him for 80 years isn't that amazing God got his attention God trained him so he had an understanding of the way the things of Egypt worked but the Egypt would have shoved all sorts of other stuff into him. God then took 40 years to get Egypt out of him. But that understanding would not have gone. Because God was going to use that. He needed to understand, if you like, how things were going to work. But you see, he knew God's voice. And he responded to that of God's voice. You see, the important thing for us today is that we need to be able to discern 
from the true and the false. Far more than we have ever needed to discern between the true and the false. Would you like to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12 for a minute? And for those who are trying to watch online, who've got the slides, sorry, this isn't in the slides. But in 1 Corinthians 12, it says the following. So let me start the pages together. And it says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. We must not be an ignorant people at this time. If ever we have needed God's discernment and God's wisdom, it's now. But you see, when we jump on to verse 7, it says the following. It says, there are all sorts of gifts, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to not just the leaders, each one, for the profit of all, to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, another word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith of the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another workings of miracles, to another prophecy, and another a prophecy to discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretations of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing them to each one individually as he wills. But in there is a little bit of peace, it says, another discerning of spirits. We need to be those who discern what is the voice of God and what is the voice of the enemy who will try and get in as well. You see, Satan is like a roaring lion. We need, as we learned the other Tuesday evening, we talked about armour. We need to be those who know our armour. We also need to, as Noah I always say, you need to know in our Noah what's going on. Noah knew, didn't he? Noah didn't have a thus saith the Lord, build an ark as such, but he knew the voice of God directing him. We need to be those who know in our Noah what's going on. If we've got the perfect peace of God, we can, have, we can go in a situation and we can go, I'm not sure about that, and we can back off. When everybody around us is shouting this, 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 we can know what we should be doing. And then we jump on to verse 5 and it says, He said, Do not draw near this place, for take your sandals off, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The place where God is at that point in time. We need to know a place where we can meet with God. This should be a place where we can meet with God, but we can only come here once a week. Do you have a place where you can go and you can meet with God? I think it's Charles and John Wesley's mother had a blanket that she went under. She had a house full of children and when, when she put the blanket over her head, she was in her place with God. And the children knew, do not disturb mum. I know that Smith Wigglesworth had a place he used to go, he had a seat that he used to go and sit up in Yorkshire when he really needed to hear from God. And quite a lot of people knew Smith Wigglesworth, and they knew that when Smith Wigglesworth was on his seat, don't go too close, chances are God will convict you. But that was his place. He had a place, if you've ever read any of his books, that was a place where he went to be with God. We need to know that place, that secure place where we can go. And then in verse 6 it says the following, Moreover he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look on God. You see, right here he witnessed the Trinity of God. We find the Trinity in the Old Testament, in, Ex in Exodus chapter 3, don't we? The angel of the Lord, Jesus in pre-incarnate form. There was fire in the bush. The Holy Spirit was there. And he says here, that God said, I am the Father. So we had Father, Son and Holy Spirit manifest in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. And you see, Moses hid his face, as did Elijah, as did many of the people who experienced God when he formed in a real and a manifest way. Okay? So let's, we need to be those who can know that and we can uh, move on with God's. And so let's move on to the next verse, the next chunk. And it says in verse 7, And you see, 
God then says the following to Moses. He said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. You see, and it goes on and it says, I have heard their cry because they're taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Peshuzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. You see, God does hear. He doesn't always act in our time scales, but God does hear. That's an important thing we need to know. If you cry honestly out to the Lord for a circumstance and a situation, he hears. He may just not act in our time frames. Sometimes we need to actually um, just wait. We need to wait on God. Because God then answers. And he said, I have come to deliver and in verse 9, he said the following, he said, therefore behold the, theref, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. He heard. And I have also seen their oppression, which the Egyptians have oppressed them. God sees, God hears. You know, if you're ever witnessing to people who have a different face, you can turn around and say, we have a God who sees and hears. Does your God see and hear? Does your idol see and hear when you're round the corner? Good question. Poses a challenge to them. Because we can turn around and say, our God sees and our God hears what's going on. And then we find the following. He then comes up to the answer to the question. And I'm not sure this was the answer that Moses really wanted. He said, now come therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh. That was not the answer that Moses really wanted to hear. You know, if God said to you, right, you are the solution to the problem that we face as a world, I want you to go and talk to Boris Johnson. What? Would that be how if you were praying tomorrow about what's going on and God said to you, I want you to go? Would you reply like Moses did in verse 11? And he said, who am I? We're going to hear this so many times from Moses. Who am I? Isn't that probably, in our human form, that's how we would respond? I certainly probably would. The God said to me, right, you're the solution. This is what you've got to do. I would certainly go, no, surely not, Lord. There are surely more capable people. And this is what Moses said. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Well, actually, he was the perfect person to go to Pharaoh. Because he'd spent 40 years learning while Pharaoh thinks, how the Egyptians think. He was the perfect person. You know, when, when Satan tried to kill him, and he was therefore brought up in that, you know, everybody, if you were to read this as a story, you go, oh no, Moses, he's now being trained with Pharaoh. How's God going to save him? That was exactly what God needed. He was the perfect person. Of course he was. He just didn't see it. Who should I be? And, he, and again he said, the, who am I? But then God says the following. In verse 12, and God said, I will certainly be with you, and this will be a sign that you have brought this pin, you have brought this people out of Egypt, and you shall come back and you'll serve God on this mountain. This craggy lump in Sinai. Hot, dry, horrible. But it was a place that they were going to keep coming back to. The mountain of God, the place where God is. And in verse 13 it says the following. And he said, And Moses said, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And say to them, and they say, What is his name? What shall I say to them? He was, he was sort of looking, what was the authority on which I now go to the children of Israel? After all, he was a tarnished character, wasn't he? How did he leave? He'd left as a murderer. You know, not the sort of person who the children of Israel would say, Moses would go, I'm here, I'm come to save you, hang on Moses. Our stories tell us that you kill people. Isn't, isn't that what happened? That's how he went, he went with a tarnished character. But God says to him, I will send you. And he said, well, what is your name then? Who are you? Because he'd come 
from, it, from the land of Pharaoh where they've got loads and loads of gods, haven't they? And we'll have a look at those gods in a, in a further message. But you see, God didn't say anything. Can you imagine if he said, I am who I am? You know, it's a bit of a strange name, isn't it? I am who I am. But you see, God has always been I am. Of the past, the present and the future. And he said, moreover you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. I can just see Moses' brain going at this particular point in time. Because they were used to having gods that had names. They were used to having the children of Israel who lived among the, the Pharaoh and all the rest. They were used to having gods who'd been carved. And that was going to be their downfall later on. But you see, it says in verse 15, Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you will send, say to the children of Israel, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you, and this is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. Go therefore and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord your God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, Surely I have visited you and seen what is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the lands of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, to a land flowing of milk and honey. So in those verses... In verses 15 through to 17, God explains to Moses the background. He gives him some information that he can relay to the children of Israel. I am the God of, they'd know about Abraham. After all, Abraham left, didn't he, and came into the promised land. The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Jacob was the one who actually brought the rest of the children of Israel into, into Egypt, to a land of plenty from a time of famine. And he says to them, I will bring you out of this affliction. And he told them exactly where they were going to go. But as we know full well, their memories were very short. And in verse 18, it says the following. And God says to them, and they will heed your voice. Moses didn't say they won't listen, did he? But God already anticipated the question. He had Moses' ear. And he says, they will hear your voice and will come to you and the elders of Israel to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to our God. You see, he gave him what he was going to say to Pharaoh. Gave him very, very clear instructions. Say, go to Pharaoh. We want to go in the desert to sacrifice to our gods. And he gave the answer. Verse 19, he says the following, he says, But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. In other words, he said, go and ask, but I tell you, he's going to say no. Doesn't that, can you, can you see the logic? You're thinking, well, why waste our time? He's going to chase us out and say, get out, you know, I'm not going to listen to you. But God said it was, it, there was a reason that they had to go through this procedure. God had things in plan. But they had to give the, fir, the, the sensible ask first. And then God says in verse 20, So I will stretch out my hands and strike Egypt with all my wonders which you will do in his midst. And after that, he will let you go. You see, God said, I will punish Pharaoh for saying no. But you see, sometimes we have to go through the processes. And then we find in the next verse, and this is absolutely amazing. Because, had they left on the first request, what would have happened? What would they have left with? Their sheep, few of their possessions, not that they had very many, did they? Because they were slaves. They had virtually nothing as slaves just themselves and what they were wearing and a few bits and pieces but look what God said in verse 21 you will not leave empty handed I will give this people favour in the sight of the Egyptians and it shall be you know that's amazing isn't it 
that the, the Jews, who were the slaves, would, would have favour in the eyes of the Egyptians. Well, the Egyptians were going to say, we want rid of you, we just don't want you. And it shall be that when you go, you shall not go empty-handed. That is absolutely amazing. Now God was going to fill them. And look what he says in verse 22. It says, But every woman shall ask of her neighbour, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, of gold, and of clothing, and there's going to be so much of it, that you're going to put it on your sons and your daughters, and you will plunder the Egyptians. That is quite amazing. That they were going to leave with all this stuff that they were going to need for their journey. You see, God's provision is perfect. You see, they had nothing, but yet in the perfect will of God, they had everything. We have given up our lives to God, yet we can have everything, can we not? We can know a peace that passes all understanding. Now there's a the verse that it always reminds me, and it says, Let the peace of God, which passes all understanding, and I love the verse, in, it's, the new, it's in the King James, and it says the following, Garrison your hearts and your minds. Not just your heart, your minds. We need our... And garrison, it says protect. Protect means, yeah, I'll put a helmet on. That gives you protection, doesn't it? What does the word garrison mean? It means at least 50 to 100 soldiers it was in a garrison. He's not going to just protect us. It's not like sort of putting on some, you know, some biking gear when we're going out for a ride. He's going to put loads of protection round about us. That we will know his provision. And you see, we need to be in a point where we can just know that peace. And the question I would just leave us with this morning, and that is that, what is God calling you to do for him? at this point in time we keep coming back to this where you know you may feel i'm in the back of the desert well if you feel you're in the back of the desert be assured you will not be there forever i know i've been there god brings you out but it's a place of preparation and you see we need to come to the cleft in the rock this is on the top of the mountain of god there is a rock with a split in it and when we come to look at the provision of water, I'll show you the other side. But you see, if we remember that that rock with the split in it was where God probably met with Elijah, it was certainly where God showed his deliverance. And we need to be those who know that we're in the place where God wants us to be. But you see, we have to meet with God. Moses met with God. This was his encounter of God that changed his life forever but he was in a place to move on with God and we need to be those who are in that place let's pray father we just thank you that some of us may feel we're in the back of beyond but father the back of beyond is if it's can be in the perfect place with you father some of us may be in a place where you're saying come Listen from me. But for all of us, we need to know that we can know that peace, the peace that passes all understanding, that will garrison, wrap our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, Father, may we know this. We do not know what's going to happen. The news, the world changes so fast on an hourly basis. But, Father, you've seen it all. And we pray that we will just know and sense your presence with us in a way that we have never, ever known before. Father, just may we know that still, small voice saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. May we know real wisdom to discern the true from the false. And may we just be so full of your Holy Spirit that we are attractive to those around us, that we may be good witnesses for you 
on a moment by moment and a day by day basis we pray in Jesus name Amen and